thank, thank you, Harry. Um, I thought it was bad for, b between people and lunch, but I'm noticing that it's also bad actually to between <laughs> coffee break and then the next one. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you very much, and thank you to Backstage for inviting me again for um, here. Um, I'm going to talk about a number of subjects because open science is really wide and, and covers many topics. Uh, and it brings together some of the um, conversations we had this morning, especially Mike Nolan, um, when he was talking about uh, fellowships for um, supporting open source, but also the, diff the, the difficulties of, of uh, managing communities and governance. So the um, open science is, is kind of like, it's like OSPO. <laughs> it's a buzzword. It's, it's kind of like the thing that's happening at the moment. Um, the European Commission is, is funding uh, many projects which are, have a requirement of, of open science, of being open. Um, and I think these, the scientific community itself uh, has at last or realized again that, that um, being open actually is, uh, may produce better science and, and solve more issues. So um, the, the, the focus of the talk is really is, is can science learn from open source? Um, open source has, has already shown that it works. It, it's, efficient, it's productive, it's uh, innovative, it's inclusive. Um, and science, I think, diverged probably about 50 or 100 years ago uh, from that, those concepts, uh, and became much more oriented towards um, closing things in and, and, and monetary investment and return. So I think it's, it's, a really, it's the moment where uh, science is coming back to where it was maybe in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century, where um, people shared and, and, and grew together. So well, just a quick look at some ideas about what is open science, what people think of open science, uh, and how this links with open source and how open source can support this. Okay? So it's not just can uh, science learn from open source, it's identifying what it can learn. And that's really important, because uh, you can say, oh, obviously, everybody can learn from open source. But, but actually identifying how that can happen and what is the key concepts um, is important. Okay? So open science. Open science, it's a very big, broad umbrella term. Uh, it brings together lots of openness, uh, as you can see from here, you know, open data, open notebooks, open peer review, open code, of course, open source and op open data. Um, the, the key concept uh, I think they're trying to promote is um, sharing uh, the, the method and the process to achieve a scientific result and sharing the scientific result itself which for most people, I'd say every single person in the room, is what we do every day. Uh, it's the normal way of doing business, um, of operating. Obviously, for science, it's, it's not necessarily the case. Okay? There's a few quotes here where we can see what they're focusing on. No? It's exposing the scientific process um, and the results. So publishing the results. Um, it's done in an open manner no? uh, and giving greater access to the results of science. This is... This, this is because actually in the end, after all this, these kind of like 19th or from the 17th, 19th century idea of science being open, you know, remember Newton saying, you know, I'm, I'm on the shoulders of giants and I'm publishing my papers. Um, suddenly everything was published in journals that were pay only, papers in you know, subscription journals, scientific journals. Um, there was a focus on patenting and closing the results. There's a focus on monetizing and actually licensing out science as opposed to saying, well, how do we best improve society? So, so you see here, what the, it, it seems crazy that science should be open by nature. And then going back to Richard Stallman saying, you know, knowledge is open. It's, it's, it's the natural status of knowledge is to be open. Um, uh, whereas here we're saying, well, we have to open science. Well, I think it's reopen it, but never mind. Anyway. So, and you can see here that it, it, it's very complex because science is obviously is a huge area of endeavor. Um, and it's not just the way we do science, it's what's been used in science, like data, like uh, open access here. This is Foster uh, Open Source at EU, which is an initiative to, to support the open science um, initiative in, in Europe. Okay, but it's not just actually the results, it's also the evaluation, how it's evaluated, what policies are put into place, um, what tools are being used to support uh, open science. So it's a very big endeavor. Um, just as I would probably say the open source movement probably 20 years ago, uh, it's, it's similar in, in that respect. So science is 20 years behind us in, in that case. And the other thing um, which is interesting at last, I would say at last, is that they've moved from the concept of open science being open access, which means having access to the papers, um, you know, open access publishing like the Public Library of Science, um, to actually opening the process. 
which is the methodology, uh, the way things are doing. So it's, it's not just uh, we can cook things up in, in private and then we have a result and we publish the result and the result is accessible to everybody. Now, I know there are open source projects that do do that. Um, I'm not going to name any of them because they don't necessarily develop in the open, but at least they do publish the code um, and enable others, obviously, to fork or to take the code and do what they want. But it's interesting that, that science is not just saying, let's open the results, but actually let's open the process. Um, and here, obviously, we can see the, the huge analogy between publishing early uh, on a repository and actually involving other people in the process of developing um, and being inclusive in that, in that respect. Okay, so the objective, just summarizing the objectives here, which I think is a good, a good paper or, or book, actually, by the National, the American, the US National Academies of Sciences, which is a kind of significant in, institution. Now, it says the, the objective is to ensure the free availability and usability to really important concepts, because availability means we can read it. Usability means we have a license to use that knowledge of scholarly publications, but not just the publications, no, the data, the results from it, and the methodologies, code and algorithms. So actually, the concept of open science has evolved from being open access to actually the whole thing, which is great, I would say, in that, in that sense. Okay? And if we look, um, maybe COVID was one of the big areas where open science has been applied in a manner that um, it should be in, in the sense of, of scientists around the world sharing their um, data, sharing their knowledge, um, to speed up uh, drug discovery in, in that specific in this in this case. No? Um, NASA NASA has been obviously we we know that NASA has been in favour of open source for many many years. Does anybody remember the NASA license? Oh yeah, NASA had its own license in the old days. I think it's been kind of like uh, put to bed or something. But um, they have their own initiative. Great again, 2018. Um, so it's it's kind of like everybody's on the bandwagon, and some people have been doing it for many years. Um, others are, are, and here's just an example for the paper of what, why they say they do it. And if you look at the kind of the, the motives, it's really interesting now. Increased transparency of results, no? um, democratization of the scientific process, uh, accessibility. So all these are kind of like stuff we do every day. It's kind of like nothing new. So but it's kind of surprising that the huge scientific community, you know, 500,000, I think it's in, in, in Europe, uh, for them is kind of like world changing paradigm which is a, a, bit, a bit of a pity, okay? So, so if you look at what, what, what the kind of this, this book, this, this paper says, you know, the overarching principle of open science by design is that its research is conducted openly and transparently leads to better science. Well, I think that's total plagiarism, if I may say, because in 1999, actually, Eric Raymond actually nearly said that word by word. And you could just substitute open source for science and you have exactly the same idea, you know, that the, 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 the reason for opening the code um, for development is it produces better code. Uh, I won't go into the debate about whether the licensing is to do with freedom, it's to do with uh, better, but at least here it's to do with better code. So, why is this? Well, obviously there, there are significant similarities between um, source, source code software and, and science, and, 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 and science, scientific results. Uh, and if you go back to the discussions in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, um, there was a lo lot of kind of quite conceptual philosophical and, um, analysis of, or economic analysis of software uh, and the network effects of software and the ease of which it can be developed and shared um, due to its nature being non-rival, which means that I can have the code, you can have the code and there's no fight about it. Um, and it's non-scarce, which means that the, actually you can have a second, a third, a fourth, a hundred million copies of the same code. Okay, so th that specific nature of software makes it very economically interesting in that um, the, the management of it and the, the ownership and the licensing uh, is much more flexible than having, for example, a motor car. A motor car, my car is rival because I, if, I, if I have it, you don't have it. Okay, and obviously each additional copy of the car has, has a, a cost to make it. So that, the economics of it is very similar. So, so we say that about a code, but you can say that, you know, a chemical formula, or you can say it about a, a method, you know, a new method in mathematics or whatever, that we can share that knowledge. I can have it, you can have it, and there's no conflict about um, us using it. Okay, and the other similarity, I think, between open source and open sciences is, is the objectives that um, the community tried to achieve 
Um, and the first one, obviously, is, and the first two are very evident, is access and reproducibility, which obviously we can see in the open source licenses. Um, you know, free access to the code and freedom to reproduce the code, um, testing it. But I think also there an, is an objective towards reliability and responsibility. Uh, this I put in, in italics, because obviously there's lots of open source code which is not necessarily very reliable. There's probably often no maintenance, as we've been mentioning. Um, and assuming responsibility for that, for that uh, actual technology is not always the case, as you can see. If, if you've read, who's read an open source license? Everybody had that. What is it? You know the, the bits in block capitals that, you know, it says, I wash my hands of this, I am not responsible for anything you do with this. But then science is like that as well. They can say, here's the chemical formula. You know, this is the basic science about the chemical formula. What you do with that chemical formula is not my problem. No, scientific, scientific things. Okay, so there's actually quite a lot of similarities, which means that what we know about open source and how open source uh, benefits uh, society, we can actually kind of by analogy try to move into the, the science as a whole. But unfortunately, unfortunately, there are some blockers, <laughs> which I think which is what we and the scientific community. So quick question here, how many scientists in the room? How many researchers in the room? How many former researchers in the room? Not very many. Okay, just that, that's it. It's quite interesting because back in 2010, there was a survey and they, they found out some, nearly 50% of open source software was developed by the academic community from, from, from juniors all the way through to PhD, postdocs, professors. Um, so obviously, you know, it, there is a huge amount of science in, in, in open source. Okay, so what's different? And, and this is what's going to cause problems um, in, in saying let's achieve the efficiency and let's achieve the, the um, productivity of open source and let's try and put that into open science and make it value for society. Well, there's, there, there are a big difference in practice. Practice in open source, we know, publish often, publish early. You get post-publication peer review because once it's published, then people will look at your code uh, and, and comment on it and improve it and, and fix it. Okay? And then it's a cycle, you repeat. Okay? The scientific uh, process is not quite the same. Okay? First of all, you publish maybe once, because it's a thesis or it's a paper or whatever it is, and you publish really carefully. There's a peer review that happens before it gets published. Okay? Um, there's no real kind of like iterative contribution to fixing or to improving. It's more like a, a warfare between different research groups who disagree on a specific point. So you have counter papers and you have, and if, you, if anybody remembers the story of HIV um, and how there was the laboratories in the US and in France were competing. I mean, I mean can you think of it? Competing to try and um, uh, get a drug for solving HIV. I mean, I think COVID has actually shown us that that was particularly stupid, if I may say. Um, anyway, and then repeat. I mean, how many researchers, those who are researching in the room, they, they publish their paper. They maybe, do an, uh, they maybe have another contract for doing some postdoc, but that's it. And they go on to another job or they get hired by Google. Um, and so there's, there's no sustainability. There's no necessary sustainability. Whereas uh, there's no necessary sustainability in open source either. But there is a more, there's a greater chance of, of sustainability and repeat in open source because the code is there, there's an interest is there. It gets published for a reason. Okay. Pay, uh, science, science is okay, it's a bit more basic in, in, in terms of the scientific knowledge it produces. But there's no, there's no kind of like generation of community and iteration and correction. And, and, and that I think is important in terms of practices. The other difference, which is really important, is, is protection, legal protection. I'm a lawyer, so I'm sorry to say that <laughs> I'm involved in this. But um, the main IPR objective, the IP objective in, in a scientific institution is, is patents or our return on investment through licensing. Why? Because that's how universities are measured. They're measured by them. That's how they get funded. The, the, the incentive system for uh, uh, creating science is towards protection, patent protections, and licensing that, getting that monopoly. You know, anybody in the room in open source hears the word monopoly, and we say, Bleh. we don't want that. Okay? Uh, and then we're looking for spin outs, we're looking for licensing opportunities. Because the economic role of this is we give protection, that we can license it, we get money from licensing, and we put that back into further research, which is a virtuous economic circle, but doesn't necessarily work. Okay? Um, because there's all sorts of if, you know, if, if you get financing, if the person, you know, puts money back into it. So in open source, 
Open source actually had to reverse the whole IP system to work. We have to have licenses, which are a patch on top of IP, copyright, even patent, to actually make, open it up and share the code. So we have this kind of IP conflict with the government and the universities and the research centers says, yeah, we've got to patent this, or we've got to protect this, we've got to find a spinner. And the open source community is saying, no, 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 we've got to publish this, we've got to get better code in, and, and we don't really care about that. We, we hate software patents, and we want open, we want to kind of like, we give license terms that actually reduce IP protection. Okay, so that there's a difference in there. Difference in motivation, significant difference in motivation. You know? um, motivation of most scientists um, in science projects is publish, publish or perish, we, you know that. Um, for the universities and for the, uh, it's the numbers of papers you have on your curriculum, which is really important. Okay, that could be cool because okay, well, if the paper is like a software release, the number of software releases actually is also quite important. So there is an ana analogy there. Okay, but um, the number of patents you have on your curriculum is also very important. So that that comes back in again. Okay, and and your impact is calculated on citations. Okay. Now, maybe you could say, oh, yeah, well, open source impact is measured in dependencies. Oh, our friends, the dependencies. Yeah? Because um, that's basically what a dependency is. It's a citation of a previous work, which is being embedded into your own work. No? But I think the motivation of someone working in an open source community, even if it is, there's a great analogy, because there are also scientists who contribute. Um, the, the technical reputation of being the maintainer or having contributed specific code, um, is, it's a bit like making that publication, but then there's continuity in that. It goes on, you know, you are the maintainer. It doesn't mean I'm the maintainer today. It means I've been the maintainer for the last four years. And that what has value in it. Um, there was a famous, well, I don't say famous, I saw it in the news, uh, in the online, is Intel in 2015, where they were hiring, I don't know how many people. And they say, we don't want any patent holders. We want people who have run and managed open source projects. They literally wrote that. They said, patent holders do not apply. Um, because they were saying, we want people with the, the staying power, the sustainability, the maintenance, the reputation of, of actually being there um, and sharing and improving and having that open mind of collaboration. Okay? What else? Implementation actually is difficult. And this is the one that's really going to be very difficult to deal with. In software, the implementation of a software uh, program is nearly zero marginal cost. The software is there, you implement it. There's a hardware cost, the electricity cost, whatever. But actually, most software in the software uh, is implemented uh, at a very low marginal cost. Okay? In science, especially if you're in the hard sciences or life sciences, the implementation is massive. You need a laboratory, you need manufacturing uh, facilities. So there is a there's a huge difference in economics um, in the actual implementation. But that's not all science. A lot of science is basic science. It's just generating knowledge. So, so I mean, maybe we'd have to get rid of thinking of open science and the, the level of creating drugs, but actually inventing them. We can certainly have um, that there. Okay? So, <clears throat> and that's what I'd say. We need to maybe distinguish between basic science and applied science. Um, certainly being easier to share and to um, uh, have this analogy with open source in, in, in basic scientific um, research. Okay? So, so the, um, and there's other, other, there are other ones, but those are the four main ones. COVID was interesting because actually the, there's been quite a lot of papers written about it uh, and how you know, we, we, we achieved drug discovery and, and, and man testing and manufacture and delivery in less than two years, which was inc incredible. But the trouble was is obviously they do see risks in, in applying an open source style model to um, medical drug discovery. For example, here, for example, that there's sharing something that hasn't been peer reviewed or sharing something that the press takes it up and says, oh, suddenly this drug works, which is total rubbish. It didn't work. It's just that it was suggested in a paper that it might work. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an impact there. One of the risks of, of publishing too early uh, and without the scientific kind of like founding that, that is required for, for um, strong science. Okay. Anyway, so that, that, that says that just so, so the open science see is it does... Um, share a lot of characteristics of open source. So we can look for uh, gains and we can look for things working together, partnership. Okay? But there are differences we have to look, we'll look at It's important. Okay? And um, we work, I work with quite a lot of universities um, who are trying to get onto this open science bandwagon, kind of do it and be there and, and do it properly. And, and difficult questions for them. You're saying, well, what can we share as open science? 
You know, what, what, how do we identify the assets that are going to have value, provide value through open sharing as opposed to through proprietary licensing? Because that's quite a difficult, uh, difficult for them. And so the, the default being we protect and we close, which is, which is terrible. In 2009, I, tried to, I wrote the IP policy for university, and, and we had open by default, closed if necessary, which is the current open data uh, slogan. But that's totally anti anything that's written by universities. Um, so what processes can you open? So that's easy. You know, if you can identify research results, okay, that's easy because it's open access main, mainly and open licensing. But actually, I mean, what processes can be used to open? And, and then when you get researchers start shaking the knees and saying, ooh, you know, can I open my lab books? Are people going to start looking at how I carry out my science? And that really gives them terror. Um, whereas people who do, uh, write open code and they, they submit it, are you frightened when you submit open code to a... You, you find that the, kind of the maintainer is going to say, this is shitty code, get rid of it, I don't want it. Yeah? No? I don't know. I, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a software writer, so uh, I, I get worried if people look at my contracts and say, this is really bad, or if a judge looks at my contract and says, ah, this is really, really bad. But that's kind of like peer review after the fact, okay? And then the other one is this question of community. Because we, we keep on saying here in Backstage is the open source community uh, conference. Is you can only really have open source that works if you build community. Um, whether it's a tiny, closed community, wider, massive community like Linux. You need that community. Uh, and that's where the, a lot of the problems are. And just imagine, does anybody know an open university which kind of works on building community? Except Mike Nolan. Thank you, Mike Nolan. Brilliant. I love your talk this morning about um, Rochester. Is it, he, did you go to the talk, Mike, this morning? He said, you know, instead of our exploitation strategy is not looking for a patent and licensing, it's, it's building community, and we're going to invest the money in helping people create community. And I said, well, I wish that the European and the national uh, ministries of education evaluated and, and, uh, universities on community, members of their community, that would be brilliant. Okay, so it's difficult. So, um, time's coming up, so I have to, I have to stop, but... Uh, the conclude and comes to conclusion. So the question is, you know, can open source and open science be good bedfellows? That's an English expression. Nothing wrong about that. It's very good. Uh, and what can we learn? So, so some conclusions, um, and this is kind of like two or three, four work years working with different universities, research centres. Well, 15 years, but I, I think I'm younger than I am. Um, it was too many years. God, man, 15 years trying to get universities to do open source. Anyway. What, some, some things important. One, software is everywhere. Um, I think it was the lead developer in, in Samsung that says software is eating the world. Was it Samsung um, on, on Android? Um, software is eating the world and open source is eating software. So, so you know, that's going to happen. But actually, it's actually getting heavily into all the other sciences. It's into social sciences. It's into modeling drug discovery. It's into mechanics. It's into electromechanics. It's into everything because everything is simulated, modeled, tested in a machine first. It's much faster. Um, obviously, then you do tests in the real world, but software is going everywhere. And a lot of the papers, even in life sciences, actually being published not on uh, clinical trials. They've been, they've been published on simulations in, um, in virtual machines. Okay? So software is getting really important. So not just, we're not just talking about the software faculty. We're talking about any, any faculty, basically. Okay? The second thing is, is that I think open science is forcing a step. And I didn't, do, does anybody recognize this from the kind of like 2010? This is from the Eclipse Foundation, but actually they've copied it from, I think, Gardner, who copied it from someone, who copied it from someone. Okay? Open source, we can reuse. The idea is that companies or people, they, they, they first say, we have no open source in our company. 2005, we have no open source. Even Microsoft was saying that. Okay? Then they say, yeah, well, we use a little bit of open source. And they say, oh, we actually build it and we contribute it. Okay? And they say, no, no, we have our own open source projects. You know, this is kind of the scale of getting good, good, better and better and going, going, going to heaven and, and eternal life. Okay? And then obviously they're jumping into a strategic decision, we are an open source based company. Okay? And I do say that carefully. Not an open source company. We're an open source based company. What, what they're trying to do is, that I, I think most universities around here, a little bit around here, and most universities have no idea how much open source the research groups are producing. Okay? And the open science is trying to jump the gun and put them here. And that is kind of like a culture change, which is really, really difficult. Maybe they have some little bit here, but they're trying to push it as open science as a strategic decision. 
And, and as, as you know in anything about culture change and management change, you can't do that in five years. That's kind of like a 15-year project, if not more. Okay? But at least we can try and go up. <laughs> we can try and do some steps to go up. And this is where open source can help. Okay? So how can we help? Well, I think we can persuade science that there is strength, a lot of strength, a lot of value through openness and freedom. So get rid of all those patents. Um, copyright's fine. Put everything out on, in, in, in um, develop in, in, in the open, you know, and, and share in the open. I think there's, open source can show that. It has shown it, but we, the message needs to be transmitted better. Everything depends on licenses. That's because I'm a lawyer, of course. <laughs> uh, it actually, it doesn't. Everything probably depends on pizza and, and developers getting together and having pizza parties. But um, licensing is important because that's what actually reduces this terrible legal protection and opens things up for the world. Um, and it's what is the charter for many, many communities evolve around. I, we are GPL and we will not be anything other than GPL. GPL 2 even, not even 3. Okay? And as we've seen in Backstage, we know that community and governance are really, really important. Okay? So what's happening is that <coughs> universities are starting to understand that they can re-understand, that they can actually build openly. Um, some of them understand licensing. They're getting better. Obviously, this is crazy because most of the licenses have a university name. MIT, BSD, I mean, you know. And then, but what they're probably having difficulties with this is community and governance. And, and, and uh, community has an exploitation path is, is, is essential in open source because you're not going to get companies. It's a long-term plan for having companies based and then you have to have pretty good VCs or whoever it is who want to put money into it. And, you know, th that happens, thankfully, but it's actually quite a long path. Okay? So what do we need? We need to change an approach to what we were talking about before. Motivations, expectations, um, uh, the, the concept of what is reward, what is value. Um, and value is not measured in patents and, and, and uh, investment income. Okay, so, <clears throat> and we also need to understand that one, so, one, one size does not fit all. You can have a little bit of open science here, you can have a bit more open science here, and I think you can have a lot of open science there. So I think it's really measuring the open science to your shoe, as we say in English, or your shoe to your foot, um, is going to be really, really important. Okay, so that's, I think, the, 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 the core of what I wanted to say. There are some practical implications. One is easy, just license science correctly. Has anybody looked at data. Have you ever tried to download open data sets in Zen, uh, Zen, what's it called, Zendo or something? Yeah? Do you look at the license? It's terrible. There's, there's kind of like non-academic, non-commercial academic licenses. There's do not use for drug uh, diagnosis. Um, give some, you know, kind of fill in this form and, and uh, maybe I'll send you the data. I mean, come on. Get the licensing right. It's so easy. We've done it for 25, 30 years. Um, I think the, the universities should, should redo their um, strategic plans. In, in, you know, the universities, they, they usually have a, an IP policy, which is all about protection and staff and remunerating staff. And there's kind of like a little bit at the end saying, oh, maybe they can license out and whatever. No, they, they really need to focus on rebuilding that whole exploitation strategy um, th through the open source lens, as in collaboration, as in community, as in governance, um, the things I mentioned earlier. Okay? Um, and I think... This, it, it, the quick wins are, are to avoid something that looks open source, but it's not. Okay, so, oh, I've released the data, but you have to write to me to come and get it, data access from. Oh, I've received it under kind of for, the, for the academic community. Yeah, but that's not open source. That's just kind of like non-commercial. Uh, not interested in that. Okay. Um, to the, these days, there's all sorts of machine learning, and, and I'm not going to mention AI because it's another word like blockchain that we don't talk about anymore. But uh, data is essential, and there's so much bad data licensing. So that should be an easy, quick win for, for, for people to sort out, to have open data. Chances. Okay? And it's actually interesting that back in 2018, which is kind of like years ago, centuries ago, pre-COVID, um, the, the, uh, the, the same uh, academic science was saying they need to change, create a culture that activity supports open science and changing the rewards and the support. So, so, so I think the institutions, they know it. But actually, as we say in English, the devil is in the details and actually implementing it and changing the mindset of all these universities and research centers is really, really complex. Okay? A couple of comments closing off. Marcus Hanwell, he was at opensource.com, but he's also an um, open scientist, uh, chief open science ist, -ist at uh, Kirk something. I he used to build software program tools for developers, for, for scientists. Um, and, and, and he actually repeats what the next person says, is that Open science actually is going back 
to the, to the 17th century when they were saying, you know, don't trust until it's been proved. And that's what we do in open source. We, we, we test the code, we look at it, we read it, we read the code, okay? Don't take people's word for it, you know, and make it available, make it public, make it accessible so that they can be tested and, and tried and reproducible. So that's nothing new. And, and, and this guy, who's, you know, a not very well-known uh, open source developer, um, he said the same thing, which is really interesting, you know, where science is improving on people's ideas. So it's not just the idea of being open and reproducibility, but actually building on the shoulders of giants and improving on other people's work. Okay? So it's the question I asked at the beginning, which was, can science learn from open source? Actually, it's a bit like GNU. I can't remember what it's called when it's, it's something is re uh, recursive. It's can science learn from open source, who actually originally learned from the initial principles of science, which is reproducibility and accessibility. Okay, so that's a little bit where I want to be. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope that this evolves positively in the future. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So we're a time. bit short in time, so maybe we'll take one quick question. Um, Okay, so if there's, if there's no questions, it means it's either absolutely amazing and fantastic and everybody understood it, or actually no one understood it at all. So, I have so many, but I'll come to you later. Okay, so. with a coffee, with a cup of coffee, <laughs> or with a car. Okay, we can do it in the questions. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.